right now on Politics Unplugged, a bill to limit how cities can regulate new housing developments now sit on Governor Hobbs' desk. We'll talk with the state lawmaker who wants to see that signed into law. And she's been a city prosecutor and a sports agent. Now Tamika Wooten wants to be the Maricopa County attorney. We'll speak with her. And President Biden schedules a valley visit as the presidential preference election draws closer. Our panel weighs in next on Politics Unplugged. And good evening. I am political editor Dennis Welch. This is Politics Unplugged. And the state legislature passed uh, the Arizona Starter Home Act. Uh, it's billed as a way to make housing more affordable by putting strict limits on how cities can regulate developments. The bill passed with the support from both sides of the aisle and now goes to the governor uh, for her signature. And here to talk about that is state lawmaker Annalise Ortiz, a Democrat representing the West Valley. She joins us now to talk about all of that. And I want to just clear this out. We, we tape on Friday mornings. As of right now, the governor's office still up in the air, whether they will sign the bill, whether they will veto the bill or allow it to go into law without her signature. So things could change by the time this airs on Sunday. But uh, as it stands right now, still uh, you're still wanting the governor to sign this piece of legislation. Um, specifically, how is this going to help address the uh, uh, affordable housing um, crisis here in Arizona? Well, it's a very simple bill, Dennis. Mm -hmm. The Arizona Starter Homes Act aims to re-legalize the types of smaller starter homes that Arizona families were able to purchase in the 50s and 60s. We're talking about homes on smaller lots, maybe with a carport instead of a garage, uh, without those kinds of luxury amenities. Mm -hmm. And those types of homes have been regulated out of existence by city regulations that require very large lot sizes mm -hmm. and certain types of roof tiles for example, or again, you must have a garage. So this is simply saying for any new developments, this will not impact existing neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. Those new developments should be allowed to build smaller starter homes if they want so that Arizona families can find a house that fits their family size and their budget. And, uh, you know, the cities and towns, obviously, they are very angry at this about this bill and upset about this because they say it takes their regulating authority, uh, zoning laws, it takes it out of their hands. Uh, what do you say to them when they come to you and say, you you know, uh, representative, you know, we know our, our, our community better than you do. Why are you taking this control away from us? Well, first of all, I knock on the same doors that the city council mm -hmm. members knock on. And what I hear from my constituents is that housing is at crisis levels, that people cannot afford to become homeowners. And as it, it is a statewide crisis, and as a lawmaker, it is my duty to respond to this mm -hmm. on the state level. Now, what is frustrating is that the city, the League of Cities and Towns, has admitted that they refuse to come to the negotiating table mm -hmm. on this bill. So we have to start somewhere. And the fact that they were not even willing to entertain conversations about negotiations shows to me that they don't want state level solutions, but the community is demanding state level solutions. Now, is this, is this something that could fix the housing crisis on its own or is it kind of a start? And I say this because my understanding of the problem in Arizona is, is supply to, an old fashioned supply demand problem. Uh, Maricopa County, I believe 25, 26% of the homes, according to MAG, the Maricopa Association of Governments, is owned by out of state investors. Um, you know, does this really address the housing crisis or is it just kind of getting at the edges of it? Housing is so complex, there is no silver bullet to solve it. What we absolutely know to be true is that housing supply has not kept up with demand in the state of Arizona, and that is driving up costs. In other jurisdictions that have passed zoning reforms of this nature, they have seen rent slow down uh, in terms of the rent increases and more people being able to achieve that American dream of home ownership. Now, do we need to get a hold of the corporate investors and put in some more regulations and accountability? Absolutely, and that's something... I will continue to advocate for, but we cannot slow down development right now mm -hmm. at a time that Maricopa County in particular continues to be one of the fastest growing counties in the nation. And another criticism I heard was, why would this exempt cities, towns with the populations of under 70,000 people? I think two of the main sponsors of the bill, Sonny Borelli, Leo Biasucci, that would exclude their districts from underneath this. I would like to see the bill, um, th these types of statewide zoning reform measures be uh, statewide mm -hmm. and, and be true to that. Um, but what we know is that we wanted to hyper focus in on the areas where we are seeing the highest uh, growth. Mm -hmm. And I think this bill does what is intended to meet the workforce in those cities with populations over 70,000. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about uh, teachers, firefighters, veterans who cannot afford to own a home, even though they work more than 40 hours a week. 
make. Mm -hmm. So those are the changes that we want to be seeing. Uh, and uh, two, I was also, uh, there's a recent story out of Sedona, and this wouldn't apply to a Sedona, and Sedona's got such a housing price, uh, crisis there. Uh, that they passed some controversial project that would allow workers who work there during the day to actually sleep in their cars in parking lots. Shouldn't this, a bill like this also address those kinds of communities? Oh, you know, absolutely. And I think mm -hmm. that story is just horrific and it shows how crucial the need for affordable housing solutions really is right now. Mm -hmm. We should not be uh, having hardworking people sleeping in their cars in the United States of America. We also have several other bills moving through the legislature to address affordable housing in all of our communities. Mm -hmm. But I do want to be clear that the Starter Homes Act is the only bill that specifically deals with home ownership. So again, we need all of these solutions working in conjunction with each other. All right. And a final question here I do uh, want to ask you about this is what has the conversations been like with the governor's office? I mean, what kinds of questions are they asking you about and what's the sense from, that you're getting at this point? Well, we know that Governor Hobbs has made home ownership specifically a key priority of her administration. She's focused on uh, wanting to increase down payment assistance for people. But the important point I want to reiterate is that if people have down payment assistance, they have to use it somewhere and they cannot use it if we don't have the housing stock available. Uh, the governor also um, cares about uh, the negotiation and making sure that the cities uh, had an opportunity to come to the table. And again, I say we asked the League of Cities and Towns to participate taken these negotiations to help us get to a solution on starter homes and smaller lot sizes, and we are not um, getting that type of uh, willingness to come to the table. Well, let me ask you then a final, real final question then. What are they saying why they're not going to come to the table, cities and towns, on this? What are they telling you? The League of Cities and Towns has said that zoning reform is a non-starter for them okay. on the state level, but we cannot have that be the case because nationwide we are seeing state governments stepping in to address the housing crisis with common sense zoning reform. We're talking about red and blue states, Montana, Oregon. And if Governor Hobbs is to veto this bill, she would be the only governor nationwide to veto a zoning reform measure of this nature. Again, either Republican or Democrat. It's a bipartisan issue. All right. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us there, Representative Annalise Ortiz. Thank you very much. And still ahead, Tamika Wooten has been an attorney, a prosecutor, and even a sports agent. Now she wants to run for county attorney. She joins us next when Politics Unplugged continues. And welcome back to Politics Unplugged. Tamika Wooten has been a practicing attorney for nearly 30 years. Now she wants to bring her experience to the Maricopa County Attorney's Office. She joins me now to talk about why she's decided to run for this race. Um, first of all, welcome to the show. First time on, as always, uh, new candidates here. Um, just give you a, 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 a little bit of time just to explain who you are and why you're running. Thank you, Dennis, for having me. I'm excited to be here. Mm -hmm. you know, I've been fortunate to practice law in Arizona. Now it's 34 years, actually. Okay. In my I don't, want, don't, don't want to cheat you out of four years <laughs> exactly, there. Exactly. <laughs> you know? But actually, I've worked here in Arizona um, as an attorney for the entire 34 years. I started my career off as a prosecutor, first in the city of Tucson, then Glendale, actually as the chief city prosecutor. Then I went over and uh, began felony defense work. Okay. And then I've also been a, a pro tem judge. So I've mm -hmm. done all three sides of the criminal arena, about the equal amount of time. Okay. And uh, since we did tease it in the intro, I do want to ask you, sports agent, just before we get into some of the issues, I mean, I, I think it's going to catch a lot of people, you know, a little, a little bit like, you know, they'll perk up with that. It's like, well, what's going on? What kind of sports agent were you? Football. Oh. Actually, I grew up in Southern California, and my father never had any sons. Okay. So my sister and I, he would take us to Laker games, Ram games, Dodger games, and so that's what we, got, we uh, grew up doing. And mm -hmm. so I was like, you know what, I want to get into that. I saw Georgia <laughs> Frontieri at the time she owned the Rams, and yeah. I'm like, if she can do it, I can do it. So that's why I decided to do it. Okay, let's get into the politics of the whole thing. Not, the first, not, not your first rodeo. You, you tried to run before. Uh, you didn't get the signatures. The last time around, you fell short by just a handful of signatures. Uh, you, know, bef you know, before you can actually be on the ballot, you got to qualify for the ballot. Um, where are you on that signature right now? You have until April 1st to collect the necessary signatures to qualify. How's that going this time? Are you going to make it? I'm going to make it this time, Dennis. Last time I missed it by 18 signatures. And the heartbreaking thing is um, 
you know, that's when COVID hit. So mm -hmm. we had to mail out petitions and people mailed them back. Mm -hmm. So right after I got back from the county, return, uh, county recorder's office, I went to the mailbox and I had those additional 18 signatures. Oh, this year, though, we can do equal. We could not do equal before. Yeah. So I've been in the race 17 days and we're already at 2,500 signatures. And you need about 4,000, correct? And, and we're going to, we're, they're rolling in at least 200 a day. So we're great. Okay. And uh, let's get down to the, to, to the issues. What prompted you to come out and, and run? I mean, this is a late entry into the race, uh, but why, so why are you doing this? You know, um, Dennis, I've always been passionate about justice and making sure that people are treated with fairness, dignity, and respect. So again, I started my career as a prosecutor, and then I went over to the defense side. And during those 15 years or so while I was a defense attorney, you know, the, the county attorneys would make a running joke actually about, let's see how many years in prison we could give people. And that was just upsetting mm -hmm. because I had a lot of clients with mental health needs, substance abuse needs, and there are definitely people who need to be separated from society. But there's also people who need to have those underlying uh, needs met and, and uh, addressed. So that way we don't have that revolving door. Mm -hmm. um, and then also as a judge, you know, as a judge, there's certain things we can do, but there's certain things that we cannot do. Mm -hmm. And so the person with the most uh, power and ability to make that change is the, the county attorney or the prosecutor in the courtroom. And what kind of changes do you want to see made? I mean, let's, let, well, first of all, before we get into that, what are the, are the criticisms right now about the current office holder? Because you got to give a, make a compelling reason why the incumbent, uh, who's facing her own primary, but why should the incumbent shouldn't keep her job? What's, what's going on there? You know, justice should be blind. And the current administrator, uh, administration rather, you know, they look at, um, they're seeking convictions as opposed to seeking justice. Again, I have a global perspective of, of, of the criminal law. And so I believe that my personal experience as well as my prosecutorial experience and professional experience will give me that global perspective so that I can let the people in the community know that everybody will be served uh, equally and fairly, no matter what their socioeconomic status is, their skin color, everyone will receive justice equally. And what does that mean for like the brand uh, 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 that you're going to bring to the office? Because a lot of Republicans like to attack Democrats saying, oh, we've seen what happens uh, with Democratic prosecutors. They'll point to cities like San Francisco and whatnot. What is that going to look like if, if you are in office? Um, as I mentioned before, there are certain people that do need to be separated from society. Mm -hmm. But again, we also need to address those underlying needs. So I'm going to make sure that people are treated equally and fairly. I'm not going to charge one person as a misdemeanor because they look one way or one person as a felony because they look the other way because I've seen that happen. I'm not going to do things where one person gets sentenced or plea offer one particular way. Mm -hmm. But then if they're in a different uh, political realm, they get charged a different way. Okay, okay. And um, so it, what would be the top issue day one, you're elected, let's say next in, in January, you win this race, you're in the office, what's the first thing you do? Um, again, bridging that gap uh, between law enforcement and community, mm -hmm. uh, making sure that everybody feels like they're being seen and heard, that mm -hmm. justice is served for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and I do want to get your thoughts on this right now. We've seen a lot of uh, discussion right now. Um, about uh, is, is stemming from uh, you know what we've seen out in the East Valley with the so-called Gilbert goons, and we've seen a lot of uh, reporting, a lot of talk about quote teen violence. Um, you know, I don't know if teen violence is on the rise. I haven't seen the metrics. There's data out there or whatnot. I, but I do want to get your 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 take on the Maricopa County Attorney's handling of this case so far. You know, I think she drug her feet on this mm -hmm. um, because. Again, if it was a different demographic, I believe that person would have been brought in immediately and mm -hmm. uh, indicted. It okay. took four months, I believe, in order for them to get the indictment, and they had the information that they needed to bring those initial indictments. It's not uncommon for the county attorney to add additional charges while a person is in custody. Mm -hmm. um, so again, I think that her decision to now suddenly bring those charges was uh, motivated by political reasons. Okay, and maybe unpack that a little bit more, like political reasons, like what do you mean by that? Well, there were a lot of people that were complaining, you mm -hmm. know, that she wasn't moving fast enough. And again, they had the basic information um, to prosecute those uh, young men for the charges. And then when uh, the additional uh, person on the other side of the table jumped in the race, and then when I jumped in the race, <laughs> then all of a sudden, here comes the charges. All right. I want to thank you very much, Tamika Wooten. You're running for Maricopa County Attorney. Thank you very much for stopping by here. Pleasure talking with you. Welcome back. Anytime you want to come back here and chat. Thank so you, and up, coming up next, I'll be bringing in our panel to talk about all of this week's major headlines, including President Biden 
coming to Arizona ahead of our presidential preference election. That's next, right here on Politics Unplugged. And welcome back to Politics Unplugged. Arizona's presidential preference election is on Tuesday, even though the Democratic and Republican nominees are already set. And here to talk about that and so much more, former Democratic lawmaker Reginald Boulding and Republican consultant Marcus Del Artino. Like the tie, you're all Irished up here today. Happy, Happy St. Patrick's, Patrick's Day. Happy from yes. the Italian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with you. Uh, you know, uh, President Biden coming to town uh, post State of the Union. We'll get into that here in a minute. But coming to town on the presidential preference election. What's he hoping to accomplish by coming out here at this point? Just pick up the energy level. I mean, you know, look, we're looking at 1980 all over again. When you look at the wrong track numbers match up at President Carter's timeline, uh, his approval disapprovals match up to Carter's. So it's a 1980 scenario right now. Inflation's number one, number two issue uh, in the country. And so he's got to get some energy going and get that base moving and excited about uh, his presidency and his run. I expect him to be in Arizona a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and so be ready to, for your commutes to get stalled out in traffic <laughs> as the motorcade goes on by. And tell us, what, what's, what's the mood like with Democrat voters now? Because I've, I've talked to some folks, uh, you know, on the Biden side of things who have expressed that maybe there's not much excitement yet for this camp, for, for, for the Biden campaign yet, even though it's still early and things can change. But What's the stat? What are you feeling right now? You know, Democrats know right now that there is an existential threat, and that is former President Donald Trump. So whether or not they're jumping up and down to say we're 100 uh, percent, you know, ready to go to the polls for Biden, they are they know that Donald Trump cannot be elected. But if we take a step back and we look at some of President Biden's achievements, we're talking about historic job numbers. We're talking about way that he's getting, you know, in Arizona, you look at manufacturing, look at our economy. From that standpoint, things are, things can improve, mm -hmm. but Biden has actually done a very, very great job. Yeah, and a lot of it though right now, a lot of politics, unfortunately or not, you want to say it's policy and there's a lot of style points involved yeah. in, in this. And a lot has been talked about Biden's performance, connecting it with his age. Um, how did he do on the State of the Union speech? It, was, it, se it seems like the reviews are it was energetic and, and received, but what'd you think? I thought he did a great job. You know, when, when I talked to my friends on the other side of the aisle, they say, first they called him Sleepy Joe, mm -hmm. and then they said he was too angry, he was too excited with the State of the Union. You, you gotta pick one, you gotta, you gotta figure out what, what you're gonna say. But I thought he did a great job, and I thought his messaging was dead on, right on point. I thought you seen the... Republican caucus uh, in the chamber show what I think uh, many of them will be doing during the you know campaign trail, sort of out of control, off out of line with what the the public is asking. I thought he did a great job. And Marcus, State of the Union bump. You you you've been talking to me and said there there, there is no there, there is, is no, no bump. bump. <laughs> Nothing's happened. What's going on? I I. Just think that most voters have probably already made up their mind. I think the number of actually undecided voters is probably historically at a record low. Um, and so it would be difficult to bump those numbers, number one. Number two is, remember, this is a long race. we got a long way to go. The impetus on him, the sitting president, is to keep that energy up, level up uh, for the next several months. Otherwise, sort of that... Uh, that liability of his age continues to grow as, as he makes his appearances. But, but, but the Republican Donald Trump, I mean, how does, how does this play out the rest of the year? There's going to be more court appearances, more verdicts that could come out. Doesn't that, isn't that going to take a toll? Clearly not. Uh, I mean, I think we've seen time and time again that that only benefits him. His numbers and his fundraising continue to grow the more times they put him in front of a judge. Mm -hmm. Look, would that have happened 20 years ago? No. Uh, but it's happening now, and it's it's a strange phenomenon in politics, and it exists. And uh, you know, I don't I don't think it will have an effect on his campaign. Well, I want to get a take on you on yeah. that. Do you agree with Marcus on that? With all these court appearances and you know, and these court rulings and things like that, do you think this slows down Trump at all with 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 voters, persuadable voters, people who are out there that may be on the fence? Well, there is a group of folks who are going to vote for pre uh, former President sure. Trump, regardless, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but there are pragmatic, moderate voters who I do believe, you know, if they see a conviction, if they see evidence, that I believe that they're going to move, they're going to move over to Biden. And with regards to the, the age compound, look, look, let's look at this thing. Trump would have been in the same high school. He would have been in the same high school as Biden. He's three years younger than Biden. So when we're talking about age, I mean, we're talking about essentially two guys who are both, you know, 
very, very old. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and for, in, in fairness, too, I know a lot of people spend a lot of time on social media, and you see the clips with the gaffes with Biden and whatnot. Yeah. There are just as many gaffes with President Trump as well. I mean, age is a fact. You know, Biden's over 80. Trump is almost there. Uh, you know, that's, one of the, that's just something that happens. I, I do want to talk to you, though, about the issue of immigration. Um, how important it is, do you think, to voters in Arizona? And side note to that, do you think Cinema gave, you know, Biden and other Democrats a parting gift on her way out with this bipartisan border deal? Because with Republicans torpedoing in that bill, Democrats can now say, we're the ones that want to get tough on the border. You know, when you look at immigration, it's actually very nuanced here in Arizona. Depending on what part of the state you're in, immigration is an issue. In other places, it's not an issue. People are talking about the economy. They're talking about the war. They're talking about other things. They're talking about housing, you know, mm -hmm. housing prices, That's housing stock. So it, 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 there's, a, there's a group of folks who are focused on immigration. With that said, you know, uh, Senator Sinema, she did come out with a bill that had, at, we thought, bipartisan support mm -hmm. that, you know, Republicans and former President Donald Trump refused to support. So we either have to try to get things done or we have to call it what it is, and, and, that, and which is politics at play. And Marcus, you've been talking about immigration for a while. You're saying it's, you've been saying for a while now too, that it's the big issue in Arizona. How does that play, the, the, the bipartisan border bill, now that you know, Trump and Republicans killed that bill? Well, you know, certainly expect Donald Trump to talk about the wall and all those border mm -hmm. policies that he talked about and he implemented um, and courts have reversed and et cetera, et cetera. But he's going to concentrate on immigration because not only is it the number one issue in Arizona, it's one of the top two issues throughout the country, which are inflation and uh, immigration. So, you know, at the end of the day, controlling the top two issues sort of benefits him. And uh, let's move over now. Let's talk about, uh, a little bit about the Senate race. Kind of, it's kind of all adjacent yeah. at this point. Um, Carrie Lake this morning on Friday morning filed her signatures to qualify for the ballot. You know, looks like it's going to be a head-to-head -head matchup in the fall between uh, Gallego and Lake. I know Lake still faces some opposition in the primary with mm -hmm. uh, uh, Pinell County Sheriff Mark Lamb, but Lake is by far the big leader on this. What do you think are going to be the issues that define this race coming up? Ultimately, it's going to come down to, to personality and getting messages out. I mean, in addition to the top of the ticket, let's 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 this is going to be the reality. I mean, one of the things that I do think is important is that Carrie Lake has been defined by Arizona. You're either with her or you're not, you mm -hmm. know, whether you're a Republican, Democrat or moderate. And with Ruben Gallego, there are a group of people who just don't know his story. They yeah. don't know, you know, his service in the military, state legislature, Congress. So I think he has a story. I know he now has ads that are running out and I think he's trying to shape the message and tell who he is. I, so I think that, you know, it's going to come down to, you know, messaging story and, and, and personalities of the two candidates. Yeah, and it does have that new ad that came out. It's a biographical ad. It, tells about, it talks about him growing up. It talks about his time uh, in the service, at, at time at, uh, at Harvard University. Um, it's going to be Carrie Lake's job to kind of like define Gallego at this point. Isn't it getting kind of late? I mean, I know there's a lot of time left, but like, you know, Ruben's <laughs> out with this with this ad. He's, it's a million well, dollar buy. Yeah, Ruben's pulling a playbook from uh, Mark Kelly. And that is define yourself before your opponent can yeah. define you. That's smart um, politics, And that's isn't smart it? politics. That's good strategy. Um, but, you know, up until this point, Ruben really hasn't been that well defined. He's got the smallest congressional district uh, in the state. Uh, and so I think that there's going to be plenty of time and plenty of opportunity for uh, certainly the NRSC, the National Republican Senatorial Committee, mm -hmm. to step in. Uh, and do some defining on, on Ruben as we, as we go into the home stretch. And then keep in mind also the top two issues are going to be immigration and inflation. All right, we're going to have to end it right there. That is all the time we have. But be sure to join us next week for more Politics Unplugged. Good night.